Hey, hey, welcome to Startup Dad Headquarters, where we're exploring the intersection between fatherhood, entrepreneurship, and life. And today, Startup Dads, I'm really excited to have on the show, Justin Worsham. So Justin is a family man from Modesta, California. His three albums, I'm a Good Husband, Paternally Challenge, and I Love My Kids, I Swear, are featured on Blue Collar Radio on Sirius XM. Justin has also been seen on Comics Without Borders with Russell Peters on Showtime and played Jimmy Kimmel in Not Another Celebrity Movie. That's awesome. Justin also hosts a comedy podcast for dads called The Dad Podcast, which is how I initially found and connected with Justin. And that podcast is featured as one of Stitcher's top parenting podcasts and another podcast for CBS Play.it Network, which is called Justin is Married, Booker is Single. Justin lives in Burbank, California now with his high school sweetheart and their two boys. Justin, I'm really excited to have you on the show. You've already been having me laughing before we even hit broadcast. So I'm excited to have you on the show and have some fun uh, and talking to you today. So welcome to Startup Dad Headquarters. Well, thank you for having me. Whatever excitement level you have, I just know I'm a, I'm a one-upper. So I'm going to try and take it up two more notches. So that's why I'm going to talk loud. And if you get more excited, I'm just going to get louder until we break. <laughs> nice. You know, I my my 42 podcast episodes prior to this these current ones, I was sitting down and I found I couldn't keep up with the energy level with some of my guests. So I decided I'm going to stand up oh, just for someone is, like this, you. This is the first standing show. I am I am on the inaugural mission of standing up, Joel. That's right. That's I, right. Feel it. I feel it through the interwebs. I feel your energy. I, I, I'm sitting down though. I think I'm screwing this whole thing up. I'm in a very comfortable, like fake leather office chair. Yeah, but you, I start you, to fall asleep, just yell at me. No, man, but your backdrop, it looks like you have a very comfortable chair because with everything you have going on back there, I can't see you skipping on a chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a $5,000 chair. <laughs> it's uncomfortable as all get out, but I do it because I'm that kind of guy. I right. like to do a lot of power moves for no reason at all. Just they, right. they're, they're inexplicable. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Justin, I told the audience a little bit about you. Obviously, they know what kind of show we're about to have. Please take a second and let us know what's really exciting you about your business right now. We're definitely going to get into your journey. And, we, and of course, this is the start of that headquarters, so we're going to talk about the family. But let us know what's really exciting you about your business right now. Uh, what I like is the, I'm really getting more and more passionate about the dad podcast in particular. I mean, I, it's very interesting. You've already said what's exciting about my business because it made me think I might be failing because I don't know exactly what my business is. I it's, and it's really weird to say my business is talking, but to a certain extent that is, I, I have turned into a self-employed endeavor, my stand up. Uh, I do work as a voiceover actor as well. And then I have these two podcasts that, you know, uh, that help me pay the bills. That's that's the gist of it. Uh, but the dad podcast is something I'm very, very excited about because it's growing. I really like where I feel like I'm kind of finally hitting a stride with what I want the show to be. I always wanted it to be a morning show that was targeted for dads and family men. And uh, I really feel like it. Like I said, I feel like it's hitting its stride and 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 I like where it's going. Yeah, that's, I can, life. that's all I know is being married and have kids. So it's <laughs> nice. It's nice when whatever you do all the time is also what you try to make a little bit of money doing too. All right, right. And I think that's a similar vision I had with start of that headquarters where it kind of combining the fatherhood aspect of things and then the entrepreneur aspect of things, which I know uh, is a pretty big deal for both uh, for both ends when you're talking about a guy, right? Because as, as a dad, you're trying to figure out so many things, not not to even mention trying to figure out how to be a good husband or figure out what the heck your wife is trying to tell you, but you're trying to be a good dad, right? 
<laughs> yeah. and at the same time, now you want to you want to create, you want to build, you want to leave a legacy like uh, uh, Les Brown or someone else said. You want to leave a legacy for your children's children. Um, so that's kind of weird. Don't worry, I think yeah, was isn't it's like don't worry about your children, worry about your children's children. Is right. that exactly exactly? And, it's, and that's where Startup Dad kind of came about. It's kind of combining those two things, which I'm passionate about being a dad and then being an entrepreneur and trying to figure it out and creating that lifestyle that I want. So I'm really excited about having you on the show. I love the podcast as well. You're up to how many episodes now? I thought I saw like 140 something. Yeah, we're well, we're at that like 165 is what is slated to come out technically next week, depending on I don't know when people are listening to this. But uh, before that, previous to that, I did about 110 episodes with my first co-host. So I've been doing the show since, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm, I'm remembering this. It's about 2011 and we started doing a, an episode a week. I did it with a, uh, the original co-host for about a, a couple of years. And then recently at the beginning of this year, 2015, we started doing uh, tw two episodes a week. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, this is the this is actually your part of, like you said, the standing version of uh, Startup Dad Headquarters. Well, I'm taking the show to five days a week. Actually, tomorrow, June 2nd, will be the official launch of the first episode of uh, the five days a week. Actually, today I re I'm releasing uh, a new format episode, but then tomorrow we actually go into the interviews and everything like that. So well, Joel, let me speak on behalf of your listeners that we're all going to be very concerned about you. I mean, you're you're going to be not only doing shows five days a week, but you're going to be standing five days. That's a big leap, big guy. Okay, <laughs> you got a kid now. Listen, you're. I'm looking at your face. You're a very young and handsome guy, I'm sure, but. We, everybody knows when you got kids, they suck a lot of energy out of you. So right. Hydrated. Remember that. You know what I mean? Eat lots yeah. of you know, uh, potassium rich foods. out. Yeah. He's got a water bottle. Good. Always be armed with water. Yes, drink it. Yes. Take it. in. <laughs> 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 Just, you know, don't don't lock your knees because then you'll be like a groom who passes out you know, limber, you know what i mean swivel the hips every now and then right 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 Five, two shows not standing just sit on a pilates ball just to see how that makes you feel maybe you're energized and bouncing around a little bit i'm i'm not telling you how to do your job i'm just saying i'm just throwing right, it out right right experiment experiment yeah. try different things see how it feels <laughs> yeah, my, my wife is supposed to be getting me some uh ll bean very comfortable shoes so i can kind of stay here and stuff now the one thing that i do uh that i'm doing is that i'm doing all my interviews on monday so even though the show is five days a week i'm trying to knock out all the interviews all on monday so that uh, the rest of the week i'm sitting on my butt so yep <laughs> and it's like that. That makes me think of that thing where they say that you know men, uh, every men say like nine thousand words a day, and women say like fourteen, whatever it is. But most of the time, men use all the words that they want to say up in their work day before they come home, and then their wives still have more that they have to say. You're actually killing out a month's worth of your words in one day. Your wife will never. Either she's really, if she's a talker, she's going to be very happy because you're just going to be sitting there nodding a lot going, I got nothing left in the tank, honey. What, until you get me those L.L. Bean shoes, all I have is eye contact. That is all I have for you. Or if she wants to, you know, you can't even muster up a, I, I know, right? Like you got to be able to have that ready for her. So just right. so stay high. We're, we're learning a lot. Stay hydrated. Keep your knees loose. And save a few words for the wife. You know what I mean? Don't want to give it all to just the listeners. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. I got all that. Now, uh, you know, is this coming is... coming through that I'm obnoxious? Is that coming through? <laughs> no, man. <This> is... <laughs> Does the internet have a setting of bandwidth for obnoxious behavior? The, the good thing is I can filter a lot of this stuff out, so... Okay. <laughs> Adobe has a filter for that. And, uh, Adobe has a filter for that. When the, when the listeners hear it, it's just me going, thanks for having me, Joel. Joel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, <laughs> so you know we, of course, this is start of their headquarters, and the the quote that I like to use to kick this off, uh, this segment is: "No other success can compensate for failure in the home." Would you agree, Justin? Yeah, I. I don't know if I'm understanding the quote, but I was actually literally before I came to do this show, I was having a play date with one of my son's friends. And we were kind of talking about this same concept where my dad was big on struggle. You know what I mean? Like you always nothing is ever learned or gained from something that's just given to you. He always he always thought it was very uh, I said, he's 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 definitely alive. I'm sounding I'm talking like he's dead. But the, 
he wanted you to work and earn everything that that uh, that I that I had, and I always appreciated that. I didn't appreciate it then, but as an adult, and you you realize it in life is that you know the things that kind of come easy, they're not really as enjoyed, or or you don't find them as enjoyable as things you really had to fight through, and mm-hmm. and really struggle hard, and then you come out on top. You're like, yes, I got it, I nailed it. Yeah, definitely, I love that. And uh, so with everything that you have going on. Between the, the you know the voiceover acting, the radio um, station, the the speaking that you love to do, co- comedian, and I checked out some of your YouTube stuff as well, which is pretty awesome. Oh, uh, thanks. How are you balancing uh, everything you have going on and you know being a husband and a good father? Because you have two. Uh, how how old are your little ones? Uh, well, that's I might not be the best guest for your show. I don't know the age of my children. I haven't seen their faces. Uh, sometimes I forget their name. It's a little cute thing that I do. It makes them cry. Uh, <laughs> I have two boys that are uh, my younger one will be six in June. Uh, so this month and then I have a or no, I'm sorry. See, I'm now I made a joke and then it became real. I have a three year old who will be four. <laughs> All credibility gone. There it goes. Can you filter out that? Can you filter out making me a horrible father? Is there a filter for that? I really need that a lot. Crank that up to 10 on me. Um, No, my three-year-old will be four in June, and then my six-year-old will be seven in September. And yeah, two boys. uh, I think that answers your question. Oh, how do I balance? That's the other part. It's honestly what's great about what I do is that the schedule is – incredibly flexible. So I was actually talking about this earlier today too, is that the nice thing is, is that if I don't go and say audition for voiceover uh, work as a good example, I, I, it, I could take the day off if I want to take a day off. But the downside is, is that if I'm not working, there's also no potential income that I could be earning from that moment. So it's a, a constant struggle that I kind of have. And I try to suppress to remind myself like, it's good for you to be present and be here with the kids. And it's really nice. My, my father has helped me out a lot in that where I struggled, especially with stand up, because for anybody who isn't aware of stand up comedy, you, you go out for five days at a time and you're you're away from your family. You're just you're gone on the road. And in order for you to make a, 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 a somewhat decent living, you have to be gone two, sometimes three, sometimes even four weeks out of the month. And you'll come home, touch home for a day. But for the most part, you'll be gone for two weeks in a row. And that was the part of the lifestyle that really ate at me. Okay. But I, and, I, and when I first found out that I was going to be a father, I was, I was kind of paranoid about all of it, the, the financial aspect and stuff. But my dad told me, he said, it's not about the quantity of time that you spend. It is about the quality of time. And I thought he was just, you know, quoting some, something that Dale Carnegie said or some car, you know, garbage like that. But when, when I got older, he actually dropped this thing on me where he said, you know, when you were a kid, how often would you say I was around, like around the age of five to eight? And I said, all the time. He goes, I was gone two to three weeks out of every month when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. You like sales. So he would leave. And, and I was shocked because I had no idea. So if there's any dad out there who maybe you're, you're struggling, I, I think a lot of guys who are doing the entrepreneurial thing, building their own business and stuff, especially if they're family oriented, are doing it for the same reason we're discussing is that you want to be present. You want to be there with your kids uh, and just try to not have that guilt. If I can get up on a soapbox is that don't have the guilt because you're there, whether you think that you are or not. It's not about that. And there's studies that there was a study I just read that came out of England that actually showed it is more about what you do with the time that you have than the amount of time that you spend with your kids. And that doesn't mean that every moment you spend with them has to be a Disneyland-esque moment. It just means you have to be there and and just hanging out with them. I mean, even just watching a movie, I really think is a lot for kids that we as adults carry a lot of guilt, or maybe I'm just talking for myself, that you you worry a lot today as a parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that because, you know, just this morning with my my daughter, because I help with getting them up and everything like that, is uh, my two-year-old, she was going to, I mean, my four-year-old, see, now I'm messing up with the ages. <laughs> my, 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 my four-year-old had a doctor's appointment, and when I went into the room, so we had to get her up extra early than normal. When I went into the room, she was still, like, passed out. So I just got, you know, went underneath the blankets, and just, like, she just rolled right into my arm. Oh, we, isn't that the best? Know, that was the greatest. Oh, yeah. oh. And we just laid there for, like, 15 minutes, and she's, like, my four-year-old, she's, like, a, like, a, thermostat or something like that like a heater she's just like so hot and it's so i'm in massachusetts actually it was like 59 degrees this morning in the house 
and she's so warm and it felt so great. And then, you know, she asked me, Dad, can you lay with me tonight before, you know, when we go to, when she goes to bed? So it's like, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's just those moments where you just take a few minutes to just really be there, really be present and enjoy kind of the moment. So yeah. definitely. Now, with everything going on and, you, you know, your wife, we haven't talked about whether your wife is, a, is your wife a stay at home mom or does she work? No, my wife works full time. And uh, that was another kind of thing. I don't, I don't know if anybody listening could, would relate to this. I hope not. And all honesty, I hope that you're more progressive than I certainly was. But early on in my career, even per, before kids, it was a lot of my wife essentially supporting us through the, my stand-up career. And then when we you know, started a family and all that stuff, I, I was fortunate enough and put the work in to where I could build it to where now it's something that makes good money. But in the beginning, it was not that way. Now I'm kind of pulling my weight. And it's a, it was an interesting thing for me because it, you would like to think that in the year 2015, even if we're going back as far as 2010 and 11, when this was an issue for me, that you would the the gender roles or whatever you want to call it, would have slipped out of us enough that we could go, listen, the family overall is happy. It's not like my wife doesn't like her job. She loves what she does. Uh, and I like what I'm doing. And, and so everybody's coming out winning. But there was this part of the, the, the guy side of me that didn't feel like I was a caveman going out and bringing home okay. some more that I had slaughtered and providing for my family. And it made me feel weaker. And I wish I could say that I even overcame that. But I honestly didn't really find comfort in it until I was able to build, I guess, the business of me talking. I hate saying that. I'm so sorry. Wow. But I mean, uh, it's, until I could build my business into something that was at least helping. And, and I don't make as much money as my wife does, if I'm being completely frank. But what I am able to do is come close to matching what she makes and I don't, I work like a 10th of the time mm. and I don't. And if, if you're an entrepreneur, I don't think that that is just in the entertainment world. I really think that it is a part of uh, America specifically, in my opinion, that should be taught in, because I do think it's a part of the American dream. I, I feel like I need like trumpets playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so blowhardy in my life, but I am. I'm passionate about this. I really think that there's, you know, forget algebra. All right, let's let's <laughs> let's get algebra out of high school and let's have a class on building a business for yourself because it does teach math and algebra, but in an actual practical way. And to give some, it's that to me, it always goes to that thing. It's like, why give a man fish when you could teach him mm, to fish? Yeah, and this goes to men or what? You know what I mean? If you could teach somebody the concept of building something on their own that can sustain itself. There is nothing that that person can't then accomplish with that. And I, I really think I, I, I went down a rabbit hole there and I apologize. Joel. No, 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 this is awesome. This is awesome. No, continue. But so when I, now that I'm able to do that and work a 10th of the time, it's not just because I'm in entertainment. I think anybody who's building their own business, that is definitely a feasible thing. I mean, there's a reason why when, you know, they start providing, like there was a, in the news when Obama first was elected president, there, all this hubbub was about, oh, he's going to be, it's small businesses. And what I took out of that, not the political ramifications, but I was like, how great a world are we living in where there's a huge chunk of the population that are small business owners that are in that half a million to million dollar category that they have to worry about paying that level of taxes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's what I was every time. Like now I have to make quarterly payments. And my wife was like, man, we'd have so much money if we didn't have to pay taxes. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but that's a great thing. That's a, I know it sucks. To pay, but if you're paying a lot of taxes, it means that you're doing really good. Right. You know, things, things are awesome. You know, right. well done. Good on you. Right. I'm breaking this. I'm sorry. I got really loud. <laughs> No, you're you're absolutely right, and and you know uh, one of the things that. So let me ask you this question: So are you uh, were you or are you kind of like a stay? Do you feel like you're a stay at home dad? Yes, okay. I absolutely feel like I am a I am a stay at home dad who is self employed and has been self employed for uh, uh, about a decade. Right. Uh, no longer. Wow, I think I've been completely self employed for about twelve years now. Wow. So how are you now? Let's uh, we're, we're definitely going to get into the beginning part of your journey with you know, this being started at headquarters. But how are you um, balancing before? The, so you have a three year old and a six year old. So one is still definitely at home. How yes. do you balance that? Do you um, 
do you bring in a, a nanny every now and then or do you depends just... we've been very fortunate it's this is actually my first time he's a, he just finished kindergarten so my this is the first time i've had like a summer vacation and luckily the preschool that we have will he can go there until he turns seven okay. so i'll get through this uh and to be honest like He's I this studio is located in my backyard, uh, like right up next to the house. And so he's in the house hanging out. Uh, he's old enough that he's cool with that. And I told him, I said, hey, I'm going to go out and do an interview. If you want to come out here uh, if, because something's wrong or whatever, come on out. You know what I mean? That's totally fine. But uh, don't come out and just say, hey, there's a great show on, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And there's a part of me and that even saying it out loud makes me worried that listeners are going, oh, my gosh, that kid. Because there's a weird thing that parents now deal with that our parents. I, I mean, I'm 36. So my parents never had to deal with this where there's a constant fear of safety of your children. It's like I was completely left alone with my parents being 30 minutes away at the fastest when I was his age and there was no worry. Nobody cared. <laughs> I could have set the house on fire and it would have been like, well, it was the dummy's fault. Right. Um, right. If it was my three-year-old was also there that I would be, there would be different. I would have to bring in a babysitter. So to answer your question in a much shorter way than what I have obviously done is I use the preschool. I will rely on, we have like a, a tiered system for babysitters where we have a first string, a second string, and a third string. <laughs> nice. And I work my way down the ladder. Uh, and then after that, and so far I've been lucky where that doesn't happen. The worst also has been where my wife, if I'm just backed up against a corner, my wife will say, hey, I got to cut out of work uh, early on this day. And luckily she's good enough at her job. They like her enough that they kind of go, okay, whatever they can to keep her happy kind of thing. Nice. Awesome. I love that. So, of course, this is Startup Dad Headquarters, and we want to get into your start. The, the quote that I like for this is, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Mm -hmm. Justin, take us back to the early stages of your Startup Dad journey, but then quickly fast forward to when your first son was born and how you started to manage everything around that. So I started doing, I think stand-up would probably be the beginnings of me building really a business of myself. I mean, I've always been kind of self-employed, but that was me build. I'd had like improv theater companies and stuff like that that involved other people, but this was just me. And I actually started doing stand-up. And when you, like anything, when you start into any kind of business or even any kind of job, you don't get paid very well. It's, you know, it's, you really have to just fight and scraw, you know, scratch and claw to get to where you are. And, uh, and I was seeing headway. I was fortunate enough to get picked up by a couple of headliners. In the stand-up world, you meet a headliner, and that's the last comic. That's the guy whose name was on the marquee when you came in there. And a lot of times when you're starting out, what helps you is a, a headliner will like you and think you're funny and go, hey, will you come open for me? Mm -hmm. And what they get out of it is they get to travel with somebody that they know isn't going to be an idiot or a jerk or weird. And they also know that it's they're funny enough that they set the crowd up the way they like it. And then they can help you with merch. There's all these kind of hidden dynamics to that world. But what the benefit is for the mid-level guy like I was is that I get in with these clubs. And then I meet the people who book the comics for the clubs. And so then they'll bring me back even without that person and all that stuff. So that was kind of happening. And then I was fortunate enough that there was a guy. That's how I got on Russell Peters, the Comics Without Borders thing. I was the only guy on that series on Showtime that did not know Russell Peters personally. That was, those were all of his friends. And I was opening for another guy who was going to be on the show. And the director came out to watch his set. And he liked me. They needed one more person. So he approached me after the show. And so it's like, I feel like things are happening. You're like, oh my gosh, this is great. And then I auditioned for the Funny Bones and the Improvs. Those are like the best clubs you can get in in, in the country. And right, the guy right. gave me like three or four weeks. And I'm like, I'm arriving. It's happening. And then it just kind of plateaued. And <laughs> it just stopped. And I was like struggling because I didn't have representation to try and get on television. And I was trying to figure out what I could do to make money. And, uh, and about that time is when... Uh, my wife and I decided to have children because mm -hmm. what you want to do is when you are at the most volatile moment in your life financially is go, you know what? Let's crank the difficulty up about 10 notches. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's going to be too easy for us just to be stressed <laughs> out about this burden on our own. Let's bring, let's bring a, a, a defenseless flesh slug into the mix. Let's see what happens. I mean, let's just go crazy. I mean, what could happen? I don't know. Right. And I'll never forget because what had honestly happened was I said to my wife that, my father has this great story when my wife told 
or my wife. Oh, that's I, I, I love this story. I heard I heard you yeah. mention it. <laughs> when, uh, when my mom told my dad that he she was pregnant with me, uh, he said, but in a much vulgar way, he said, "Oh crap!" But he used the S word. And then my mom was like, what do you mean? And then she started crying like, you don't want this baby. And then my dad said, no, no, to try and console her. He being a man, he said, no, no, it's just that it's another mouth to feed and we're broke. Like, you know, like <laughs> she's like, oh, you don't want that baby. and I know it sounds weird, but I did kind of want that experience for myself. Obviously not the weird, awkward, you know, kind of fight with my wife. But what I wanted was the pure shock because so much of having a family now had kind of become planned. Mm -hmm. And there was a part of it that I found interesting. So I honestly told my wife and she agreed because she's just as crazy as I am, if not more for marrying me. And I said, we'll decide when we're ready to have a family. And then from that conversation, you decide when you want to have uh, when you stop taking the pill. So that way I get to be surprised. Well, what had happened was we had kind of decided that we were going to wait two years to let me get the stand up career kind of rolling a little bit more. And then my father at 50 had a heart attack and we happened to be in town visiting him. And so we were that back at his house and he was OK in the hospital. But it kind of opened my eyes. And I said to my wife, I said, I'd rather have my kids have two more years with their grandfather than be able to make a little bit more money as a comic or build my career. So I think we should kind of think about doing that. She stopped taking the pill that night. I did not know that <laughs> about now, mind you, this isn't about 2006, 2007. And my wife does real estate for a living. So for anybody, especially wow. in the US, that is right before the bubble bursts in the real estate market and everything goes crashing down in a flaming Hindenburg esque catastrophe. And, uh, <laughs> So November, you kind of see the early tremors of this happening. And it's really kind of banks are buying each other up to try and stay alive. And and uh, I go, you know what? Maybe I should talk to my wife and say now it wouldn't be the best time considering her job and my job are no bueno. And uh, so I go, that nah, she gets it. <laughs> she, she, she knows she's an adult. Don't micromanage her, Justin. Cut to I was working at a club New Year's Eve and she did the stick thing and found out we're having a kid. And I, the thing that my father described to me, and it was exactly my experience, he said, you are hit with immediate excitement that is immediately followed by a uh, petrifying fear that is immediately rushed over with tremendous depression. Right. <laughs> and I felt all of that in what felt like less than a second. Like I was like, you're pregnant. Ah! And then I <laughs> went down my body of going, you tell jokes for a living. That's not even really a living. People don't make money doing that unless they're on television. You don't make money. You're barely made. How is she going to do everything? You can't put this on her. And then once you, all of that hits you and then you start realizing that you're a loser and that you haven't done anything and you're like, oh my gosh. And so I was kind of saddened and we actually had this on video. We were doing something for a DVD that I was releasing of my standup and the guy shot, he has this great moment that I will never forget where I'm talking to my dad and I said, and I had a moment, honest moment with my dad. I just said, dad, I don't know how I'm going to take care of a child while telling jokes. Like that's not a way to take care of a family. And in this very fatherly way, he just kind of said, don't worry, you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it then, but I did. Uh, and one of the biggest things that I did was there were lots of things that you cannot control. I cannot control who thinks I'm funny. I cannot control uh, when I get on The Tonight Show or if I get on The Tonight Show or Letterman or any of that stuff. But what I could control was how hard I worked. And what I did was I made a, a very specific and focused effort that having children kicks things up a notch for you that is just insane. And uh, sorry, I was getting a little emotional. And um. <laughs> It's remembering, it's bringing it all back, Joel. And, um, <laughs> but so what it did was I started cranking out material and realized, well, okay, what I can do is I can make as much comedy as I can and then record it and sell it as a CD and put it on iTunes. And so I was every two years, I was cranking out a new hour of material. And then it just so happened that I talked about having kids and that's a very relatable topic. And, and because I was starting this new family, there was lots of material that just kind of generates itself that, uh, and, but what really nailed it was on an off chance just to get my name out there. I didn't even know this was a thing. I sent my c CD, my first CD, I'm a good husband off to Sirius satellite radio and the guy there liked it. And, and I followed up, uh, three weeks later doing like a business thing. And he said, yeah, you're going to put you in the rotation. So I was like, great. And then when I made a new album, I sent that in and he's like, oh, we love it. Great. And then uh, I made a third album. So I sent that in. He's like, oh, yeah, great. We'll get. And now he kind of knows me. Mm -hmm. And then but it was about halfway through the, uh, just after I'd submitted that second album, 
a buzz started coming around to me where what happens is that they passed legislation back in like the 50s and 60s to say back in the day, radio stations used to have to pay royalty. So if Justin Timberlake want, uh, gets his song played on terrestrial radio, they would pay a little royalty to him. Right. But the radio stations came back and said, well, we're marketing their music for them. It's not fair that we're also paying them to have it. And so they legislation was created. Well, the loophole is for things like now Pandora, the internet, satellite, that's not a part of terrestrial radio. So I got royalties and I submitted a thing and I got a check that I was, I could buy a car and wow. I'll never forget. It was when we were at our brokest man, when my wife, we had to manage an apartment building to stay in there and we were just barely hanging on. And when you get that weird email out of the middle of nowhere saying that with that much money, you, I, I cried, I cried and, uh, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> wow. I'm remembering it. It was crazy. It, it was so like it seems so surreal at the time and unbelievable. And then I started finding out that the people at Sirius Satellite Radio liked my stuff that I was now I get played like 20, 25 times a day there. Wow. And that's as much as Dane Cook and Daniel Tosh, but right. I'm Justin Warsham. Nobody knows who Justin Warsham is, but they liked me there. And I don't know why they like me, but I'm not complaining because it helps me pay my mortgage. So why tell this long winded story, my insecure voice in my head? says. And the reason I think to tell it is that the purpose of this show is for that entrepreneur person. And that I've, I think we've all been there. We've all been in that lowest of lows where you think nothing can happen, but there's a reason why they call it an entrepreneurial spirit. And it is because if you just keep plugging away and using that spirit, using that brain of yours, something will click, whether it was not my intent to be able to make a, that amount of money or to make money from my CD being played on satellite radio. But because I'd done the legwork for something else and put the effort into things that I could control, it paid off in the end and it helped me. And so now one of the biggest reasons I pay so much in taxes is because of those <laughs> checks that I get from satellite radio. Wow. What an amazing story, Justin. Thank you for sharing that with us. And, you know, one of the quotes that I love, I don't know if you know Eric, uh, Eric Thomas. No. Eric Thomas, a motivational speaker. And one of the quotes I was pulling up while you were talking, he says, there will never be a point in your life where it's the right time to do a great thing. If you're waiting for the perfect, perfect moment, the perfect timing, it's not going to happen. You know what you, know what you have to do? You have to create that perfect moment. You have to create that perfect timing. You have to create that perfect opportunity and perfect situation. So that's exactly, I think, what you were talking about in terms of, is it the right time to have kids? Well, there's never a right time to have Hell kids. Hell no. <laughs> <Never. Yeah. laughs> My dad said that. I go, I don't know if this is the right time when she was pregnant. He goes, he said what you just said. It's never the right time. You, you right. It's unfortunate. Like, now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that if you, you know, it's uh, there. There is a right time to have eight children, right? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> there is, there is a, you, you know, if you can't, you can't be, we can't all be John and Kate plus eight in the Duggars. Right, right. But if you have a child, right. and you're struggling financially. I think that's okay. But I, I don't want to get up on a soapbox also and say, you know what? Just keep cranking them out. It'll work itself out. You know what I mean? Let's not, you know, you know what I mean? It's you make it never, it's never the right, it's never the right time to have eight children. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I would also agree. You can put that down <laughs> as a meat thing, Matt. There is never a point that anyone should have eight children. <laughs> oh my God. What my, my guest, the, my, my interview right before you actually was uh, my two o'clock interview uh -huh. has seven children. I was like, Oh my God! Are you, are you kidding me? Seven children. He hasn't. One of them is a newborn. So it's like, wow, wow. Is his, his name DNA's. Jason by any chance? Is it who? Is his name Jason by any chance? No, that, that Jason is. Uh, right, never mind. Uh, I apologize. No, no. So now, it's now it would have been a really cool moment because there's a podcaster who has like a litter of children that I know, and I would be it would be a small world moment if you were talking about him. <laughs> no. So now you know you talked about that moment where. You know, you you basically uh, finances were running out, and uh, you, you, I'm sure you guys had to start talking about, or was there a discussion about going and getting a regular nine to five? Uh, that is where I have become very fortunate in who I got to, who I tricked into marrying me. I guess is the fairest way to say it. In that she has always been very supportive, and by supportive, I mean understanding of who I am and what I am. It, but what's great about it is that 
there are other sacrifices that can be made. So I'm not, here's the thing. I don't think it would be fair for me being where I am in my position. And I'm trying to talk to, I don't, I don't sound like a pompous windbag, but I'm trying to think of talking to, if I could go back and talk to Justin from say six years ago, eight years ago, what would I say to him? And it would be stuff like this. It's that I would not necessarily push through the idea of avoiding getting a, a job because it seems like a failure uh, or that you're giving up on your ambition of your own thing. But what I would say is, is that you look at other sacrifices that can be made. And the thing that really helped me for anybody who's living in a, a cost of living an area where cost of living, as far as like housing is really crazy. Property management was a great opportunity for me. Both of my wife and I have ambitions of owning rental property and real estate. So I saw this as an opportunity to get used to being a landlord. And what it gave me was I had a nice 1200 square foot apartment that was two bedroom, two and a half bath in a very nice area that I didn't have to pay rent for. And in exchange for my rent, I would unclog a toilet or fix a garbage disposal or call a plumber to do something bigger or show an apartment and get it rented. And it really was still in that entrepreneurial niche of now it's a little bit closer to my wife's interest in, as far as real estate, but it was something that we could do that really gave us a great opportunity. And because of it, we were able to save up enough money that in just three years, we were able to pr have a down payment for a house mm. uh, that we were able to get. Um, but I, so I was lucky that I never went the nine to five thing, but if things didn't work out the way they did, I mean, it's really easy to say, well, it just worked out because I worked hard and there are opportunities and there is flux to that luck in quotes I'm putting. Right. Uh, but I also don't, I think like every entrepreneur who's listening that uh, luck is a really kind of, that's a, that's a word that'll really piss you off. It's like, we are people who work very, very hard and it's not fair. We're supposed to be modest and say, oh, we were lucky. But other people are supposed to look at us and see how hard we work. You, you don't get to call me lucky uh, right. because you, there's a lot of work that went to creating that luck. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I hope I've answered your question. But no, there was never really a time if it had gotten much worse. We were literally at three weeks and we might have to try to we might have to move back home kind of a situation. And then we started interviewing for property management jobs and then that saved our butts. What's one of the biggest failures you've had along your journey, Justin? Oh, so many. Now just to narrow them down to the biggest. <laughs> <laughs> so I added that, big, that word. Uh, yeah, I like the biggest. It couldn't be your favorite, like the one you learned. No, what's the biggest failure you've had? Ah, uh, two come to mind. I'll make these very brief, but because the, they're failures in different ways, is that when I first started doing stand up, one of the first high paying jobs I had, I got three thousand dollars to do about forty five minutes of stand up for a hospital Christmas party. It was in front of like two thousand people. It was insanely big. All the things went wrong. They they brought me up too early while people were eating, and so I'm talking over clanking dishes. The spotlight was right next to the dessert line, so every time somebody would step up in the dessert to get their cupcake in the back of the room, the light would go off and then come back on, and uh, it was just very weird. And I, I the failure that I had. And it's why I decided to go see a therapist, to be honest, at that time was while my wife was pregnant, I called her and I was upset and hurt and I was crying uh, to her going because when you grow up your entire life being defined as being the funny person and then you fail at being the thing that you are, it is very, very unsettling. It it's, feels like the rug has been yanked out from underneath you mm -hmm. and I, I called her to and, and she always I didn't realize it until this moment where I see her with her pregnant belly and I realized that every time I had a bad show or something like that or something just didn't seem right. The poor thing was having to rebuild my self-esteem. And I was like, it's not fair that she has to parent me and also going to parent this child that she's carrying. So I decided to go find a professional person and uh, change my life. I cannot say how much. If you are in any way, I feel like people treat therapy as a failure and that's unfair. I feel like therapy should be treated. If you have like a, an ankle that's just kind of bothering you for, for a certain amount of time, you would eventually go, let's go see a doctor about it. And I think it doesn't even have to be, you don't have to be a, a molested or abused as a child to go see a therapist. I was none of those things. I love my childhood and I didn't really have that many traumatic events, but the, do the therapist has helped me process those and it helped me made me a better father, a better husband, and just a better person because I understand why I do the things that I do. And I treated my brain in the same way I would my ankle. Uh, the other one is, in a and I went back to therapy for this one too, is that the uh, I was in this competition for Clorox 
and I had an opportunity to win $10,000 and we were still very broke. And this was a chance for me to really pull my weight financially. And, and it was a big cash out that I was hoping to get. And I overthought it. I way got into my head and I put way too much pressure on that moment. So for anybody who is in that phase of their life, it's interesting that you meet somebody in their 40s and what they have learned is it's that minute that you stop caring about things that things really start to become smooth and happen. And you'll see that if anybody who's you know younger than their 30s, you'll start to see that. And if you can figure it out now, more power to you. But it is that moment that I wish I could go back and just not care about the money and have a good time. Uh, and maybe that would have made losing it feel a little bit better. But I remember walking back out of the show, not being upset about the loss, really. I was just kind of like, oh, but all the crew was like, are you okay? Like they thought I was going to swallow a bullet. And I'm like, no, I'm fine. But it hit me when I came out and I saw my wife and, uh, and realized uh, she was pregnant then too. And I realized that, oh my gosh, I dropped the ball for taking care of my family. And it was a very hard blow because I go, is it that bad? She goes, uh, <laughs> so I go, oh, wow, it was bad. She goes, you just looked afraid. And it was the first time that she had looked at me kind of like, she obviously didn't think I failed her or let her down, but she just felt bad because she was like, you could have done it, you know, if you just didn't get in your own way. And that was another thing my father told me about another kind of situation in comedy where he's like, you know, there's greatness in you. Don't get in its way. That I always that I try to think of that in those moments where I start to feel myself get in my head and over worry or over stress or overthink about whatever's going on. Wow, that's that's a, two very powerful examples, and thank you for being so so vulnerable and sharing all of that with us. That that uh, especially you know we I know even with myself getting in your own way and having all those doubts and fears. <clears throat> excuse me, now I'm gonna have to filter out my own voice. <laughs> So getting all you know all those doubts and fears that are building up inside of you, and not only as a I think what's what's so powerful about what you're saying is that not only as a person, right? Not only as a man like me, Joel Lewis. Forget just not forget, but like separate the dad, the, the husband, just as a person to fail, right? And all the all the uh, emotions that come along with that, and then now to fail and to look at your wife who's pregnant and you, you yes. Know, you know, it's that's just so much. And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, there's a lot of dads that are who, who won't even take the chance, who won't even take the risk because they, they're just comfortable. One, you know, you have those that are just comfortable yeah. and then you have those that are afraid that they're going to fail. And then why take why take the risk? But yeah, and, and uh, to that point, I think I think it would help anybody to to realize that. Don't look at it as a pressure, but look at it as a motivation, if that makes sense. So don't look at the, the, the desire or the need to provide for your family as a pressure because that, that re as, as hippie as I'm sounding right now and Zen, like, oh, touch your mood ring. Where are your, where's your biorhythms crap? Uh, I mean, it in that you, if you look at it as a pressure, it could be very negative and it seems daunting and it kind of slows you down and it gets in your own way. But there is something very powerful much like a mom can lift a car off of her child. You know what I mean? In that mm -hmm. moment of me, I think there's, there's, we can't lift cars cause we're dads, but we can uh, go out and <laughs> we can improve our sales quotas. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. And I love that too. I, I have never heard of that or even, even thought about looking at it that way. Don't look at it as a pressure, but as a motivation. And that's so huge. And I think that I never, before, when we first, moved down here to Southern California. I was trying to be an actor and I was in improv and stuff like that. But when I, I didn't really do anything most of the day while my wife is at work, I'd hang out and play video games. It was a dream. And, and I did all the housework and everything, but there was nothing to do when there's no kids in the equation, but everything really kicked up a notch when my wife got pregnant and it gave you that purpose. It gave me a reason to where those moments where you're like, Oh yeah, sure. I can play a game of Madden. It's like, no, no, you don't have any room for that now. You have somebody else that you've got to work extra hard for, and, and it really is a strong motivator, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you guys do for private health insurance? Because you're, uh, you're a solopreneur, and yeah. your wife, I believe, sounds like she's a solopreneur as well. Or she's no, she's, uh, she works at a credit union, so she oh, does real estate as a side. So health care, that might not be part of her because we get it from her uh, employer. But the, I, here's the thing. I, it's an interesting thing because obviously it's a big deal to everyone because you want to be able to take care of your kids. 
And also, uh, it's a it's a huge is- issue right now, especially in America, uh, where you know they're they're like, well, it's kind of government provided, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, my father worked a long time, well after he had to. He's worth. I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but he's worth close to like two million dollars. And he realized after my grandfather passed away that he only went through two hundred thousand dollars in the remaining years of his life after he retired. And my dad was kind of like, well, I have a lot more money than that. Uh, mm-hmm. And he kept working because of health care. It was so expensive. And I, looking back and now watch, and I kept encouraging him. And I don't know, I can't have claim to have the wisdom of somebody in their mid 50s. But I can't help but think that if I was in that same situation, rather than worry about the cost of health care, I would be more worried about my quality of life. Now, I'm sure health care is a big part of that. But I would... I would. I don't know. I feel like a really big blowhard here, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that I would. I would be hesitant to let the cost of healthcare get in the way of something that I thought was much bigger and more important in the bigger picture of things. Am I making sense, Joel? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's available and it's out there. I, I, you know, and it might be expensive and and stuff like that. But you know, my dad when I was first looking at it, because that was also what started things for me, is that I got appendicitis and we didn't have healthcare. Uh, I was going to school. My wife just had like a regular part-time job, but we had a house in Northern California. And the, I remember I'm kind of conservative uh, politically. And I remember my dad making, uh, or they said, well, if you have a house, we can help you. And I remember going, oh, this is going to change everything. My father's going to disown me because I have very liberal w- opinions and go, no, they are here to help. But their solution was they were going to put a $60,000 lien on my house. So whenever I tried to refinance it or sell it, that's when they would get their money. And that was all for a less than 24-hour visit. And this is things like the actual surgery was $14,000, but the CAT scan to see if I needed the surgery was $17,000. So it was cheaper to cut me open and look at my appendix than it was to scan me to see if they needed to cut me open and take my appendix. And I, I don't know. I'm not trying to make this political in any way, shape, or form because I don't want it to dilute the the point that I'm making is that, uh, which now I've completely lost. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're an idiot, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I'm saying is, is what well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I remember the healthcare being a, a motivator that I'm like, things need to change. But the direction I chose was for something that was very secure and stable because of it. And I have kind of a part-time job because I'm trying to transition into radio and use that to build my podcast and my own business, which is my ultimate passion. But in even being in this corporate environment on a part-time level, I can really feel that I'm like, this is, this is not a place for me. I, 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 not even a situation where it's like, I'm better than these people. It's more that I think I will fail here because mm-hmm. it's like, it kind of feels like I'm a, an, a, a caged animal in a cage i mean that's like i've been confined and it's very weird and off-putting and difficult for me to navigate but if you leave me to my own devices i can generate a business that will make money and it won't be stressful it won't be weird it won't be hectic you know what i mean i i think entrepreneurs are kind of like shamu the killer whale you know what i mean like in the wild we have these proud long like dorsal fins but you put us in an aquarium and it always bends over like free will (laughs) like we could do the tricks and we could dance around the pool but it's just not quite the same and you can't tell whether we're happy or sad but you would you can't help but look at that fin and go, I just don't something's not right. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I I I completely connect with that. And one of um I think a couple of my guests actually have said something like to effect of, okay, so private health insurance is a big deal. You need it. Got it. Add that to your runway, right? When you're trying to figure out what the finances need yeah. to be, when you're trying to figure out when to take that leap, okay, add the health insurance into that picture. So that you know, okay, now I can take the leap because I'm including an extra whatever per month for health insurance. So yeah, definitely. I think it's right. Yeah, most of the time you'll be. Sh- I've I've worked with friends on their finances a lot, and uh, and you'd be shocked at when you just put a little bit of money aside. Like I have to make significant quarterly payments now for my taxes. So I just break it up by months every time I get a paycheck, whether I like it or not. And it sucks to see that. But when you when you start breaking it down into bite-sized morsels, it's that thing where you could grind up a minivan and you could eat it. You just have to eat a teaspoon at a time over so many years and you sprinkle it on your Cheerios. But eventually you will, you can consume an entire minivan. 
<laughs> I love the analogy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Justin, we're, we're we're entering to the final segment of the show. I like to call this the rapid fire. The listeners are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're like, no, no. Keep them on. Up. <laughs> keep them on. We're entering the, uh, I like to call this the rapid fire handyman segment. And this is where we quickly reach into your toolbox and you provide the start of dad, uh, dad with some really useful uh, tips, right. tactics, and tools. This is like the showcase showdown. It's like the final <laughs> round of the game the show. final round, that's right. <laughs> don't, don't go easy on me, Joel. Hit me hard. Are you ready to rock? I'm ready. I want to feel uh, it. <laughs> what is your number one time management hack or tool? Uh, but here's the thing. I, it seems like a very common answer, but I find that a lot of people don't use it. We have smartphones. Everybody has a smartphone, and nobody takes advantage of the actual things that are in the smartphone yeah. for what it's for. Like, we're all playing Candy Crush, but nobody uses the awesome like reminder tools and notes and, and all that stuff, voice memos and everything in that. And that's the thing for me, like the one that I, because I'm kind of a homemaker too. one of my favorites is this Paprika app that lets you sync and you can actually import. This is the world we live in. I could search for a recipe online and hit a button and it takes all of the information and puts it exactly where I need it to be in a recipe and stores it on my phone and on the cloud. And it makes things so quick and easy. And so I, I don't like I don't have anything more specific than that, but I'm shocked at how many people don't just take a if you just take five minutes to kind of look around on the internet, if you find something that's clunking you up and bottlenecking your day, you can find something to get around it. That's the world we live in. And you use that entrepreneurial spirit to figure that out. That's nice. my opinion. nice. So paprika, right? I got that. Paprika, yeah. It's just like the spice. It's awesome. Awesome. What's what's one way you manage your health? Ooh, I am not so good at that. <laughs> See, that's why I stand up. They say the heart is better. Oh, than the heart. I don't understand it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, I guess it's sort of like I started riding my bike to this job I got at a radio station. I mean, that's the closest thing. I used to be able to go on a walk, but I am, I am honest to God, I'm failing at that. I don't, I don't think I'm, I have, I have a, a physical actually day after tomorrow. So we'll see how well I'm doing. <laughs> but I have bad cholesterol in my family and all that stuff. And so, yeah. Uh, but I do ride the bike, try to get up and get out and, and move around with the kids and all that stuff. So nice. What's one book every startup dad should absolutely read? Oh, it, well, here's the thing. Startup for the business side of things. Uh, Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. That man saved my life financially in ways that are and it applies to all kinds of business. Another book that I really enjoyed that he recommended for business is Guerrilla Marketing. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's Guerrilla as in like Guerrilla Warfare. Because okay. one of the great concepts, and I, I, I'm not to take books away from this guy, but one of the biggest things I learned from that book that seems like such a simple concept is that if you just dedicate a certain percentage of your profits from your business back into marketing, which is something that we don't normally think of unless marketing is your business, that's you know not your niche. We're, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are so used you know, like the the bottom line overhead. What do I need to you know actual what I would call utilities like your gas, your fire, water, whatever that is in your business. We're more worried about that. Whereas marketing is a big part of it. And if you just take a small percentage and just stick it into an account for that, you'll find you could spend a lot of money on marketing. But as far as the dad part, every dad should read Baby Wise. Uh, that is a great book for when you have a baby, especially the younger ones. And they have a whole series of books uh, uh, that as they grow older too. And then also The Whole Brain Child is another great book for understanding child development. It's very, very interesting. I've had one of the authors on there, Dr. Tina Payne Bryson on my podcast, and she's just amazing, like a fountain of information. Nice. Thank you. I, I haven't heard uh, either one of those two, so I'm definitely going to check those out. And uh, as always, those will definitely be on the show notes page. So Justin, this was a fantastic interview. I do have a final question. This one's a little bit longer than the rest, but it usually produces really powerful answers. And I know with your energy, you got to really get, uh, give us a really powerful answer here. So and here it is. On the other side of this broadcast is a startup dad who at this point is fired up, ready to go, and probably laughing his butt off. <laughs> but at the end of this podcast, you know, like anything else, he's going to, uh, life is going to happen. He's going to close his laptop, his phone. And before you know it, a day, a week is going to pass. And he's going to lose that motivation and inspiration that he got from your chat. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that dad to inspire him beyond this podcast? 
My first uh, reaction is, I think the thing that we kind of touched on earlier is that in those moments where you feel like it's rough is that you look at your kids and you look at your wife or you look at your family if you're a single dad also trying to do this and you again don't look at them as a pressure but look at them as a motivation because i believe in my heart of hearts that there is no greater example that we we often confuse what we do for being selfish and self-serving but it is a very tremendous example especially here in america to set for your children that you were going to build something on your own and you were going to bust your butt to make it happen. And when you reach that level of, even, I, I don't know if there's ever a finish line, but when you reach those milestones and you get to celebrate those with your children and, and set that example for them, that's a huge thing. And especially when, if I don't know what your business is, but if, especially if it maybe is a widget oriented business or a real estate oriented thing that then now you get to build like what we talked about. I can't remember if the mics were on or not, but that, legacy for not only your children, but your children's children. When my grandfather was uh, dying, I was fortunate enough to uh, send him a message and tell him that I was unbelievably thankful for the influence that he had provided on me for me. But what I didn't realize until I started thanking him was that the influence does not stop at me. That what he had done through being loving to his wife and being in love with his wife and raising children in love that I was then the grandchild of is that I grew up watching that and I modeled my marriage after the marriage that he had with my grandmother. Uh, and I, he had, I mean, he passed away. It's not like the marriage, but you know what I mean? Like, and the fun that he had with us, he always had a great sense of humor informed and made defined what I, what I put on my taxes. And, and what I realized that is that now my kids, because they see the marriage that I have with my wife, my kids will use that as their model. And you know what I mean? And so it's this weird, what seems like a very simple man who didn't finish high school and literally would play with corn cobs. Eating corn cobs were his toys because he was born during the Great Depression and he would only get to play with those until somebody needed them to use to wipe their butt as toilet paper in the outhouse. Those were his toys. That this simple, simple man could do something that is going to have generational ramifications to people, to me, is kind of mind blowing. It's a it's a very nice ripple effect. So, again, I don't want that to seem like, man, that I got to take care of generations. No, you just got to work small and just keep working. Just keep like eating that minivan, and then and 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 use the motivation of what how this will affect lives after you're gone as the thing that'll reignite that fire. I guess. I love it. Justin, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for an exciting show. I had a blast uh, talking with you. You got my energy level back up, and I still have one more interview to go today, but I'm ready for oh, that. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know how you say it. will probably have poignant things to say, and it'll be very articulate and not rambling, <laughs> talking about minivans. <laughs> <laughs> No, tell the startup dads where they can connect with you, how they can find you, and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, uh, justincomedy.com is my website where you'll see for my stand-up and all that stuff. And uh, If you want to find the podcast, it's The Dad Podcast. But if you just do a Google search for Dad Podcast, it's the number one item that comes up there. And I'm all over Twitter under my name, and there's links to my Twitter and my Facebook and here's the thing. I don't, it's weird for me to say, but I've had people reach out to me before, especially comics. But if there is something that I said, or you just want to ask me a question, I'm totally fine. You could tweet me. You can e send me a message on Facebook or whatever. And just because I don't respond right away doesn't mean I'm not interested or uh, I'm really an a-hole in real life. I mean, I am, but uh, I try to pretend not to be on the internet is what I'm saying. <laughs> awesome, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Wrong one.